In this lecture, we'll do a quick review of some of the major features of interfaces and inheritance, and we'll just make some other side observations that, that will be uh, hopefully somewhat illuminating. We'll start with a quick review of an important idea that we've seen for quite a while now, and that idea is encapsulation. That is a, a crucial feature of object-oriented design, and essentially just means that a single object has both data and behaviors that are all wrapped together into one entity. That, that, that is what an object is, and it's specified by a class as we define it. Just to review interfaces from a few lectures ago, uh, big ideas that you were to take away. Java interfaces have a name, and they, they have a list of method headers. That's, that's really all there is to an interface. It's a list and a bunch of stubs. There's no implementation code. You can have more than one class implement a single interface. Uh, so more than one class can be a pen. That was our, our crucial example. More than one class can be a shape. It's important to note that if a variable is declared to be of an interface type, then we can associate that variable with an object of any class that implements that interface. Again, this is the, 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 the example here is if you make a pen variable, you can point a pen variable at uh, a standard pen object or a wiggle pen object or a rainbow pen object. You can point it at, at, at any class that implements that interface. And finally, if one class implements an interface, then all of its subclasses also do as well. They inherit that, uh, that contract, that relationship. So as an example, if you made a new class called thick standard pen, it's the same thing as a standard pen, it inherits everything from standard pen, except it's just a thicker mark. Uh, well, then we can point a pen variable at a thick standard pen because thick standard pen inherits the implementation of the pen interface through its superclass standard pen. Okay, coming back to this massive idea of inheritance, uh, one of the big takeaways was that a subclass can use any of the properties and any of the methods of a superclass, and it can add its own functionality. So it can use those inherited methods and variables as they are, or it can modify them. It can leave it as it is, or it can change them in whatever way it sees fit. Coming back to the idea of polymorphism, let's remember a method can do different things based on the object it's acting on. So even if I call the same method, that method can behave differently because it takes many different shapes based on the different class that it's defined in. This is a feature that we often use when we're working with abstract superclasses. Abstract classes are, are, are a way that we often bundle characteristics that a bunch of classes will have in common, but if we would never need to instantiate that particular type of object. So, you know, an example of this as well, you know, you can make an animal abstract class. You'd never have just an animal. You'd always have some type of animal. You'd have a canine or a feline or something like that. Maybe you make a person abstract class because you never have just a person. You have a type of person, a student or a teacher or a child or an adult or something like that. That's the crucial feature of abstract classes. They allow us to define common behavior that subclasses will have without having to deal with the possibility of actually instantiating an instance of that abstract class. So let's look briefly at an example of polymorphism in action. Here we've got an abstract class animal. Animal's got one instance variable name, it's got a constructor, it's got a get name method, and it's got a method called speak. That method is abstract. So you can see here in this abstract class animal, speak is not implemented. Speak is an abstract method, but in subclasses, which are not abstract, it actually will have to be implemented. So here again at the top, we see our abstract class animal, and we can see two subclasses of animal. One is lion, one is dog. Both are concrete classes. That means we can make instances of them, and in fact, we intend to. And we can see here, uh, we inherit the name instance variable, but we also add a Boolean value called isMale for the lion, and we also add a Boolean value called neutered for a dog. That's new functionality that we're adding. Now we can see here their constructors behave predictably, and uh, we have getters for the new Boolean variables that we added in dog and in lion. Uh, but we've also implemented the actual abstract method speak, which was declared in the abstract class animal. And we can see we've implemented it in two different ways. A lion says roar, and a dog says woof. Okay, so even it's the same method, and it's, it's inherited from the abstract class animal, but this is polymorphism in action. That command, speak, based on a different animal object, is going to ultimately do something different. So as an example, if I make a new dog instance and a new lion instance, and I point animal variables at them, well look, speak is an animal method, so when I call speak, it's going to look for the correct 
version of speak to call, in this case for the dog or for the lion, and it'll call that version. So though we're using the same method, two different things are going to happen, roar or wolf. So this brings us to uh, an interesting discussion. Right? Whenever you call a method, whenever you send a message to an object, Java is going to look for the matching method. And it's going to start looking for this in that particular object's class. And if necessary, it's going to move up the class hierarchy as far as it needs to go. So if you think back to our example with all the shapes, if you recall, move was a method that was defined in the abstract shape class, and both circle and rect inherit that method. They don't have their own implementations of move. They don't override the move method. They inherit it directly from abstract shape. So when we send the move message, or when we call the move method to a circle or a rect, the move method in abstract shape is the one that's activated, because there's no move method in either circle or rect. Now, on the other hand, if I call the stretch by method, Java's going to use the corresponding method in the circle class, right? if I use it on a circle. And here's a slightly more nuanced example. If I call the toString method on a circle, well, look, we're actually going to start executing in the circle class. You can see in this top version of the method, the, the, the circle class's toString version. But then when we get to this part of the implementation where we call super.toString, we're actually going to temporarily transfer to the super class. And we're going to end up calling abstract shapes toString method, which will run. And when that returns, we'll end up back here. We'll bounce back into circles toString method. And that's where we finish up. Now, here's a quirky thing that happens in the toString method of abstract shape. It calls the area method. So the question is, which version of the area method will be called? Will we call the abstract shape version of the method because we're in the abstract shapes version of toString? Or will it call the circle objects version of area because we're using a circle object? Now, if you think about it, the answer sort of makes sense. The actual object that we're using is a circle object. So when we call the area method, even in the abstract shape constructor, we're going to end up using the circle objects version of area. Now, admittedly, this is a little strange. It's weird that the toString method in a superclass activates the area method in a subclass, but there you have it. Now, to be honest, this is a really quirky, strange example. You might do this a long time before running into an actual situation where this is going to happen. But this sort of thing is very commonly tested on the AP, and it's a good opportunity to really probe your understanding of the way this is going to work. Okay, you might have noticed that there are four ways that methods in a subclass can relate to methods in a superclass. We're going to go through them real quick. The first is implementation of an abstract method. So we've seen Every subclass has to implement any abstract methods that are in its superclass. So abstract methods are really a way of requiring certain behavior in subclasses. A good example of this is the speak method that we saw in the animal and the dog and lion classes. Methods in a subclass can also extend a method in a superclass. This happens in one of two ways. So first, a subclass method might not even exist in a superclass. So for instance, a female dog might add the method have puppies, which a dog doesn't have. And we're assuming that female dog extends dog. Second possibility here is the subclass method uses the same method that already exists in the superclass, and then it also adds new behavior with its own operations, like the, its own stuff that it does. So it, as an example, in the dog class, which would, which would be our superclass, the speak method prints bow wow. And maybe the female dog extends dog, and uh, inside the female dog speak method, we have a call to super.speak, so we, we use the superclasses speak method, but then we also, in addition, print, I'm a girl dog. That would be an example of us extending the superclass version's method with some new added behavior on top. A subclass method can also completely override a superclass method. So in this case, the subclass method doesn't call the superclass method at all. That's different from the example we just talked about. Here, the subclass method is a total replacement of the superclass method. So we can see an example here. Take a second and, and pick through that if you'd like. And last of all, uh, the, the final relationship can be one of finality, where a, a method in a superclass is complete. We think of it as done. We're not going to want to allow any further modification of it. And in this case, we'll declare that method as final. That means that no subclass is allowed to modify or override, you know, change or overwrite in any way that method.
An example here would be the dog class's get scientific name method, which returns this one particular, you know, this one particular Latin uh, naming of the dog. And both female dog and male dog are both going to have that same scientific name. So we declare that method as final because we don't want female dog and male dog or any kind of dog to be able to override or change that Latin name. That's a final method. Okay, moving on to our next grab bag inheritance topic. You know, interfaces are useful and they're, they're a powerful way for organizing code, but they're not actually necessary. You know, without the shape interface, implementing abstract shape actually looks largely the same except for the header. You know, we just have public abstract class abstract shape. There's just no implements shape there. We could still include all the same methods if we wanted to. And likewise, if you wanted to, instead of declaring shape variables and associating a circle or a rect or a wheel object with those shape variables, you could just declare an abstract shape variable and, uh, and, and associate circles or rects or wheels with an abstract shape variable. That would still let you do polymorphic manipulation of those objects, say, in an array, but this time of, of type abstract shape rather than of type shape. So then the natural question you probably have is, well, why should I use an interface? Why should I bother? The short answer is they're nice, right? Interfaces are contracts and they, they give us some sense of reliability, some sense of some confidence that the class that we've written will be able to perform certain functions. Right? If you'd like, take a second and read this short little paragraph to consider why giving up the freedom to violate those conventions, why it's wor a worthwhile thing to do. But the truth is that for an intro programming class like ours, our programs are relatively short and simple, such that this distinction is, is, is maybe a little more subtle than we need to get. Once you get out there to your internship at Microsoft or at a startup or uh, whatever application you're doing in college or beyond, big idea is interfaces organize behavior, abstract classes maximize code reuse. Those are the two sort of distinct specialties of these hierarchical inheritance structures. If you'd like to explore this topic a little more, I've got some textbooks on design I can point you to, but for now I'll have you take my word for it at that. Okay, last chunk for the day, arguably the most important. I want to just briefly highlight the three different ways that classes can relate to each other. Okay, the first is that an object in one class can call a method or use an object of another class. So as an example of this, a circle object, it, it sends a message, it calls a method of the standard pen object to draw the shape, to draw itself. So in this case, the sender's object, that, that would be the, the circle object, that's the client object, it depends on the receiver object's class, and we call this relationship dependency. Okay, the circle depends on the standard pen. Second example, an object of one class can contain objects of another class as sort of structural components. So a made-up example of this is if I have objects of type classroom, maybe a classroom object has an instance variable that is an array of student objects. So a classroom contains students. We'll often say this is a has-a relationship because a classroom has a student. In fact, it has multiple students. You could also think of this as an aggregation relationship. Okay, and finally, an objects class can be a subclass of some more general class. So an example of this is, well, the wheel class is a subclass of circle, and circle is a subclass of abstract shape. So these classes are related by inheritance. In other words, this is an is-a relationship, because a wheel is a circle, and a circle is an abstract shape. In case it's helpful, here's a little pictorial guide. You can see those three relationships, dependency, aggregation, and inheritance. You might think of them as using, has-a, and is-a. Okay, that was a bunch of different topics all related under this large umbrella of inheritance. Before you close up shop, a couple things to think about. First, take a look at the following little code chunk and think about, describe how the JVM, the Java Virtual Machine, is going to find the exact right method to, to run at runtime here. Okay, try to decide what's going to happen when we do this. Second, I want you to come up with one example of dependency aggregation and inheritance, those three relationships among classes, come up with three examples of them. Okay, you can make up the classes, you don't have to write code or anything, you're just thinking at a, at a higher level, uh, at a conceptual level about 
what classes might have these three types of relationships. Just describe them. That's it for today. This is a whole bunch of topics, uh, but the, these are sort of nuanced ideas, and it's good to get exposed to them.